Hi, good evening. I'm trying to bring the guest in uh, for socio conversations. Uh, yeah, we have a very special guest here who I'm waiting for to join the conversation. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, so um, good evening and welcome to Socio Conversation, yet another episode with yet another guest. I think it gives me double pride to introduce one of my very dearest friends who has been doing exceptional work in her chosen field. The brain, the force, the energy behind Planetabled, an organization that does accessible and inclusive travel solutions for people with disability and elderly. Neha Arora, founder of The Planet Table. She is a speaker on social entrepreneurship in various universities and prestigious institutions across the country and also a TEDx speaker. She's been extensively covered by Indian and international media, including the Fox. So we know we we have a very special guest and she's not small. Welcoming Neha Arora, founder of Planetable to Socio Conversations. Yes, Neha. So to begin with, I thank think... You so uh, yeah. No, thank you so much for such a kind and wonderful introduction. <laughs> You're most welcome. So um, I think we would all love to hear your story first from having moved from a corporate space to starting something that has been quite unique and something I don't think that very many people would have thought of uh, starting Planet Able in the space that it works now. So if you could just run us through your story, why you started, I think I lost her there. Yeah, so um, I think we'll continue the conversation. Uh, but she is the force behind Planet Table, which runs customized travel solutions for people with disability and elderly. And she's been doing a phenomenal work. She has one of the very few companies in India uh, that does such exceptional work. A young achiever, um, award winner of, I mean, high intensities and low intensities. So... Uh, quite an achiever there, Neha. Yes, Neha, so you can begin with your story. Uh, thank you for dropping out a bit and then joining in again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so I was just continuing my conversation on who you are and what you do in your space. Yeah, you could, you could continue from there. Okay, so uh, just to give you a brief background, I represent a company called Planetable, uh, which provides accessible and inclusive travel solutions for people of all disability. And the whole idea is inclusion, that uh, the barrier that disability often creates when it comes to travel, that should not exist. And we were, we're trying to break that, making people with various disabilities and non-disabled to travel together. So in one group, you can have a blind person, a deaf person, a person on a wheelchair, and a person without disability, uh, all traveling together and making disability just a human feature that what makes us unique instead of, you know, uh, acting as a barrier to segregate people into groups. And uh, why I do what I do and why I left my corporate career, so-called corporate career, uh, is because uh, of, uh, uh, so we, I as a child could never travel, right? Because both my parents are persons with disabilities. My dad is blind and mother is a wheelchair user. And uh, our, uh, like, we just always saw other people going for summer holidays and winter vacations, but we never went on any. And when we grew up and we thought, okay, now we have 
uh, more earning members, so things would be easy, but it was always not the case. It was like you tra travel 2000 miles only to realize that the place is not accessible or doesn't give you the kind of experience that you would look forward to, or people would pass comments that if you face so much trouble, why do you even come? So, I mean, that's a challenge. And uh, so I picked up fights at places or got into arguments, like citing it as a human rights issue that um, like, why can't people with disability access places as equitably as other people can? And one fight at a temple turned into a mob fight. And that was the tipping point. That was in 2009, where my parents put their foot down never to travel again. And uh, then I started looking for solutions and I could not find any. And then I realized, okay, it's a problem that no mainstream travel company would ever look forward to to solve because they don't consider disabled people as customers who can pay for themselves. And um, other people might be facing the same. So hmm. yes, so other people were, when I talked to them, either they were facing the same issue or were not traveling at all. So yeah, after, I did my homework for like two, three years because I had a good corporate job that paid my bills very nicely at the end of the month uh, with a good lifestyle. So yeah, so that led me to convince myself first that whether this would work. So that took me about three or three years. And then I left my corporate job at Adobe at that time uh, to start Planetable. And now how many, we are almost uh, how many years ago uh, f how many years ago did you leave your uh, corporate job when i left that? it in 2015 november so it's been like yeah. november so exactly five years five ago. years oh okay all right um so neha now uh, going back to whatever you experienced as a child and that led to finally uh, you starting a company uh, of your own incredible uh, thinking so uh, how has that experience uh, been useful or not so useful or uh, been contributing to your larger idea of inclusion and uh, accessibility? Uh, I think the, the whole idea is that, you know, why there should be a differentiation that uh, who gets what bases the disability world for everyone right so and and that is what uh, like i try to focus upon through so travel is just a media it's i consider planetable as to be a, a crusader for inclusion whatever that industry Absolutely. or uh, whatever um, domain it might be Tra we use travel as a media and recreation and leisure as a media but there could be any media and it uh, it is across the spectrum, whether it's uh, education, employment, or whatsoever. So uh, there has to be an equitable, uh, like, uh, access for everyone, right? So, and this exists not just in disability, but across intersectionalities as well. So that is what we should look at. And that is the message uh, uh, that I'm trying, we are trying to do. But now that you have so, such extensive experience of working uh, in intersectional platforms, how would you, I mean, uh, what, how accessible is India as a country? At different pockets, <clears throat> platforms, yeah. I mean, starting with education, let's begin to, uh, begin to kind of uh, have this dialogue because I come from an educational space and you come from a, a, a travel space. Uh, more or less, we all have people uh, who believe in some structures and uh, some uh, norms uh, that we need to kind of shake and uh, maybe break at some point to, to be more inclusive, uh, which is what I have been striving to for the last so many years. And your, your struggle has been, I mean, bigger and larger uh, when compared to mine. So um, if you look at India, I mean, to st begin with, uh, how do we do this? Where do we do this? And how approachable or accessible the country is to begin with? So, uh, so, so before I answer that question, we need to understand that what accessibility means. means. Let's start from that point. Hmm. Because for most people, when you say access, it ends at a ramp and a toilet maximum. That's what accessibility means. But that is not accessibility for everyone. So there are other disabilities for them. Also, accessibility means something. But 
that is a lack of understanding I see at various places that how would a blind person access information that is out there. Most of the websites in India are not accessible. Forget being accessible. People are, who are building websites are not even aware that there is a thing called accessibility, online accessibility that exists. Like they are sometimes surprised that, oh, blind people also use websites. So we have to start from that level of awareness that, you know, there is an assumption that blind people don't use internet or websites. So, and, but, and technology is an enabler here. It has changed so much. So we are like uh, taking baby steps as in, but we are far from being, uh, you know, accessible on that front. We don't have inclusive schools in our country. For that matter, we I was like, coming you know, to that. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. So, like accessibility. When I was talking about accessibility, you need to talk of accessibility. Say for the uh, the deaf, moving on to the deaf, how much accessible information is for them? How many that they are like hardly three or four hundred sign language interpreters across the country for millions of deaf people that are there, right? And uh, the standardization of Indian sign language has like happened only a few years ago. It is still not an official language in our country. People are fighting it in the court, the activists, but it's still not there. And so the education for uh, like deaf is bad. Like people don't even think that they exist. What about the autistic people or people with other intellectual or cognitive disability? We, you know, uh, we don't talk about all these disabilities that exist across the spectrum. So uh, like we are fortunate that in 2017, we had the new disability law that came into force. It was passed in 16 and came into force in 17. That is great. It is at par with the American Disability Act that was passed 30 years ago. So uh, earlier there were only seven disabilities that were there. Now we have 21. You know, before 2017, autism wasn't even a disability. Okay. Now, as, Neha, would, in, would you have, would you, I mean, can you offhand share the 21 disabilities so that people who are watching would know? Uh, or do, so, you, do you want uh, to, kind of, yeah. I, if you, if you I know of them. Few, yeah, I few, can at least like a few. all the disabilities, most of them that we see are okay. included including all the mobility impairments that are there, whether okay. people are wheelchair users or uh, using crutches and all of that, and amputations, then you have deaf, then you have the blind, then you have uh, 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 even uh, acid attack survivors, sickle okay. cell disease, hemophilia, uh, so thalassemia. These are all disorders which are not very known in the public domain, hmm. right? But they are disabilities, and these are now recognized. Okay. So okay. this new law gives is a is a it's uh, gives access as at least on paper as of now, uh, across the spectrum, not just in built environment, but also in technology and information and communication and your education and employment across all the disabilities. So that is a good thing. But we have to see how many years do we take to implement that. Actually implement it on ground. Yeah. Yeah. So they are, So the good thing is they have given a timeline uh, uh, that by 2023, depending upon the establishment year, that by 2023, you have to be um, accessible and barrier free. But uh, that obviously will get uh, delayed over the time. That always happens. Like America took 30 years to reach where it is today. We might take a decade or two <laughs> being realistic yeah. and going by the kind of population we have. So yeah, so uh, that is where accessibility lies. You know, ki first you need to know what accessibility is. Mm -hmm. Then you move on to finding a solution for them. Right. So Neha, now uh, from your experience, because you see uh, adults, you see elderly, you also see kids with disabilities, uh, with mobility issues. So uh, now if I ha may ask you or if I have to ask you, how do we start um, 
making people aware of now I, I was even I wasn't aware of these 21 uh, disabilities that are included so uh, where do we start and how do we begin at schools because now the larger change can only happen if you begin something at the school level making children aware of certain needs and certain uh, I mean compassion compassion and how to be uh, 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 be proactive when you when you see a person with disability and things which in our mainstream curriculum, it is completely ignored. Uh, so uh, now there are a lot of uh, educators who would watch this. So how do we actually very subtly put across this message onto the table that even if it takes another two decades for India to be accessible as a country and start talking about it, how do we start the baby step steps now at schools? What small changes think, uh, or how do what what? Uh, academic programs can we think of? So we have to start from one, like, you know, the foundation line that how do we include everyone in schools? So we don't have inclusive schools at the moment. And that hmm. is where the problem rises hmm. because children by default are not judgmental. The judgmental, the, the prejudice or uh, their opinion builds up over time by the uh, the, the influence of mostly their parents, parents or their surroundings yes. or whatever then when they don't see any disabled people around that for them it, they don't exist right so uh, when we have, so the more the pe people with disabilities of all sorts are seen out in the open and in public spaces and accessing the various facilities and everything that everyone has access to like it becomes a normal site like you know so it has to become part of the ordinary normal day life that that exactly. sight of a disabled person, uh, you know, going about their daily life on the road or in the park or in the train or in the bus, you know, like that independently. That is the point. So here, when we talk of schools, majority of the schools are not inclusive. Most of them. There, there's a still a concept of special schools, you know, even for the blind or, the, or even for the deaf. So we have to start from okay how do we make schools inclusive where all types of children study together in one class right, right. so many schools have seen even my nephew like they have they take disabled students but only which are easy disabilities like dyslexia hmm. or decalcula which are learning disabilities but still you know and they don't tend to take extreme ones like blind or a wheelchair user or a deaf person because they don't have access to facilities. Like when we are talking about schools, the curriculum is the curriculum accessible to a blind person or a deaf person or an autistic person in simple language. No, we don't have that curriculum available. So um, yes, we have moved from braille to the technology so like there are so many assistive technologies that are available with the which the students can use and can be at par with any student in the class but the schools don't invest in them that uh, you know that in one's class you can have a blind child and a deaf child and a, a child with mobility impairment and a non-disabled child studying together that is what inclusion is right all sorts of children studying together yeah, so, so I think what, it's because so big, you yeah. you have parallelly you have special schools here. Uh, I mean, I think educators also take it very convenient that uh, I mean students with disabilities will get admitted there, and we don't have to foundationally uh, change a lot of things. I think the thought process goes in that that fashion or that direction rather. Yeah. So special educators would be needed, but they have to be you know as assistants in the main school. That has to be there. So they just fill in the gap uh, that they need to fill in for a student mm -hmm. to be at par. So I'll give you an example of an ex-employee of ours, a team member who has a child with autism. He had to literally fight the administration of the school and the, you know, the city uh, authority that uh, he will study here in the same school. So we have the law, but the schools normally don't uh, admit students citing that it's a problem thing for them even though his special educator his his child is on an autism spectrum he has a special educator for which he himself pays right so in developed nation it's not like that it's it's like paid by the government or the school so he pays for the special educator himself he fought for it the school 
teachers literally harassed the child that no he can't study he throws tantrums blah 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 and uh, they actually made his life difficult in the school uh, uh, for a long time until and unless this guy went to the district administrate and uh, dis uh, district magistrate and got a letter from him and asked him to intervene and make it possible so i mean it, it also tough, shows tough, that yeah it fine. is it also shows that our teachers are not equipped enough to handle it or rather they are not com compassionate enough to understand the the problem the concerns the child is facing so it's like where do yeah. we begin or where do we start the question actually comes back to the same i mean uh, where to begin or where to yeah. start so, uh, so i'll give you an uh -huh. example of a school which is doing it well hmm. so uh, there is a school here uh, in delhi in vasant vihar so a friend of mine her uh, daughter studies there so once she came home with a slap uh, mark on her face hmm. so she asked her who hit you and you know did you have a fight in the class with someone so she just casually said oh no i have a friend in my class who is autistic he just got a trigger and he hit me that's fine and she went about her day so here the role of the teacher was important that it was Ex something normal that would happen exactly and even yeah. the parent was not aware and the parent did not go to the school fighting for it that this is what happened to my child the the parent also accepted yeah it's normal fine and the child also accepted that acceptance level of has to be there most so the of the time that the we're parents talking parents about is hindered. huge yeah so the canvas that we're talking about is huge it includes stakeholders uh, from teachers to parents to i mean peer groups so uh, so i was thinking uh, the other way around neha now uh, yes we need to open our schools to children with disabilities and make it more inclusive and accessible to everyone but before that uh, isn't it a good uh, thought that we i mean kind of uh, make the children aware and more compassionate even before we throw it open to uh, uh, the the larger section so that a child does not go through this kind of uh, discrimination inside the class neither by the teachers nor by uh the peer group so such training programs or uh, awareness programs isn't it the need of the hour which is what we've been kind of trying to tell uh, but is that the right approach is what i want to kind of hear from you yeah i think it should start from training of the management and the leadership so though even if you know you if there is a neurodiversity in the leadership of the school imagine so like for example if does the principal of the school has a child with disability for that matter they would want them to study study in an inclusive school then they would make a difference right so they they but it's not necessary that they need to have a person with disability in the family to realize that fact they should be if they they are keen to you know include all sorts of students so that awareness that it is something that you know you should not exclude any sort of child it would actually you know if you're talking business then it, it would actually um, uh like if if i'm talking about most of the schools uh, you know who are run as businesses for that matter even they would have more business because the parents of these people have the money you're not taking it right so this okay. i learned no. by the, you know i run a company where people pay for themselves they travel they spend more than the non disabled counterparts so you need to understand they have the money you're not accessing that if i am putting a business case plus this is the right thing to do isn't it so because disability is something anyone can become a part of any time that's the largest minority group that any one of us can become part of it any time so tomorrow a teacher who is studying in a teaching a class might have a child in the future who has a disability what would they do then would you wait for that day to happen or you are inclusive right away to change the future for the better so if you normalize it so children are not judgmental you mix people everyone in the class and they would still consider them as their friends studying in the same class and uh, who happen to have a disability they won't judge them judgment happens later in life so and whenever whatever careers they would choose ultimately they would say they become a software engineer they will think oh i have a friend in my uh, like i have a school friend who is blind how would they access the software application that i'm building 
or if they set up a business later in life they would say oh i have a friend who's a wheelchair user what uh, so they he if he applies to work in my company how would they access so my office has to be accessible so then your thought process changes that you need to include everyone in whatever you build and in one generation you can have an inclusive society completely because one generation of schools have been transformed yeah but how many are speaking the language that you are talking now is my question <laughs> also uh, i i was just thinking aloud uh, uh, in terms of uh, the social emotional well being of a child with disability when he is uh, made to sit with a person with not so i mean not to disabled i mean i don't know whether they you have gone through any study which says that uh, children are doing or faring far better if they are in a mixed environment or if they are uh, in a in special schools uh, how, how would you i mean kind of evaluate that so neurodiversity always enhances your way of life right so whether it's a business whether it's an institution workplace whatever that is so the more neurodiverse the people are the more they learn from each other the more wider the experience pool of the group is why i ask this question and, is because we do diversity and inclusion exercises at corporate level and why are we forced to do such exercises is because of the torture and uh, the stress that a person with disability undergoes in a corporate atmosphere because of lack of cooperation and encouragement from the peer group so uh, now at adult level if this is the kind of discrimination that one has to face in workplace i was just thinking about how a child would go through or i mean sail through uh, such difficulties in a quiet uh, in a mixed environment so i the discrimination would happen only at an adult phase not as a child because you know you need to understand children accept everything for them yeah. it's like they, they don't have a prejudice so i have uh, like interacted with some college students when we were uh, talking about inclusive travel with college groups so what they said was oh i have a, a couple of disabled students in my class but uh, i tried talking to them but um, uh, um uh, i i thought they were not interested so i never tried again so but you need to understand if you're talking to a blind person they would not know that you are pushing your hand uh, for a handshake you have to be vocal about it so most of our communication that happens is visual so if there's a blind person and wall you need to tell them that you are coming inside the room and not always assume that they would recognize you from your footsteps or your voice you have to tell them this is who you are and you have entered the room and you have to tell them you're leaving the room and you have to tell them if you are doing anything visual as expression like shake uh, offering your hand for a handshake or uh, you know uh, asking a question just by you know like this they won't see it so that kind of that the communication way is different it the same applies to communicating with a deaf so i learned i did not knew sign language before i still not am very good at it i'm i know basics but the the thing is intent how how much willing are you uh willing are you to make that effort to communicate or you would just uh, show your irritation and frustration because you have to make an effort to communicate on the face of course the person other person would feel that frustration and they would not be interested in communicating because yeah you did not give them a good vibe to communicate right so but with children it doesn't uh, work like that with children it's like okay let me find an innovative way to communicate so like what happened to my friend's daughter she was like okay if even if the her classmate hit her she was like completely okay and just went about her day she did not even hit him back or reacted for that matter so that kind of uh attitude needs to be built and if the children have some sort of prejudice they should be uh, you know uh, like told that what is right and what is wrong that this is the child just like you who happens to have a disability and they don't communicate this way they communicate in sign language they don't talk verbally they talk with hands that's all so their language is different just like you know you speak malayalam and i speak hindi types it's just that the language of yes. communication is different so it's like just normalizing the differences that exist 
which i think as a society uh, as adults we sometimes fail i'll just give you a small example of how it hit me so hard uh, there was a, a, a an award function where we were being facilitated and one of the award winners was a person with difficulty so he was on a wheelchair so when when there was a person who actually walked up to him to take a selfie so he was on a wheelchair and the person who was about to take the selfie was i think 6 foot tall and then he stood there and he was clicking the picture and this person very passionately and compassionately told the other person the least you could do is just kneel down and then come to my level and then click a picture how many we we just take things for granted i, I mean even at that level we don't think that we need to come at, to to the level at which one person feels comfortable enough uh in 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 their space so as a society there is a uh, lot to be done uh, for us to be inclusive in our thinking first exactly so my you know you need to have basic empathy and sensitivity towards the diff- the kind of different person they are that's all so i'll give an example about exactly the same example which i experienced so last year we got the national award by ministry of tourism so my parents uh were there to take the award so my mother is on a wheelchair so um uh, uh the secretary journal of UNWTO he was the one who was giving the award so while he gave the award he sat down and then gave it to my mother mm-hmm. so that's the picture i know None, so uh, you know but i think somewhere it's a cultural difference as well indians mo- not many i think uh, like not many indians have that kind of sensitivity no that's they why we exist you no know, we are teaching empathy we are here to teach empathy and compassion that's exactly what is what is missing in our curriculum in our academics i mean social emotional learning is completely ignored i mean if we score marks and if we do well in our grades is the, is all that matters to us i mean that that's how that's why we've been struggling so hard to give the message out loud and clear to everyone that we are moving to a space which is very different from what it used to be maybe 20 or 30 years ago in every spectrum and every platform unless we kind of step ourselves up to reach or maybe travel along that we would be nowhere i mean we would still be where we, we used to be like 60, i mean 50 years ago when we uh, we just started off as a country so uh neha the next question that i have is now companies or organizations like socio which really uh, would want to bring about change in in the perception and thinking and attitude of people what can we do as an organization uh to maybe uh not not bring about inclusivity and uh, i mean accessibility but in the thought process of people how do we bring about a larger change through programs so i think uh, whatever program that you are doing so it's about how much diversity that we can represent in the programs okay. so for example uh walk the talk right and i would start from saying it's not something inclusion it's not something that you uh, you know you do and it's done it's a journey that you take slowly and you don't have to feel bad if you're slow but you have to keep on going make sure that you keep on going and ask for help wherever you need be but the intention to bring to be inclusive has to be there so when you are designing a program for the example make sure that the content is accessible for Got every it. sort of uh, uh audience or children right even if some you have to sometimes start with even tokenism so even if there is no audience of who is deaf for example if you have a sign language interpreter it would give out the message to all the non disabled people who are there that yes why this is important they might Absolutely. come and ask you ki why there is a sign language interpreter, interpreter. so then yeah. you will tell them okay because there are deaf people also who are accessing this right so then they'll realize the existence of the deaf person in the first place let's start from there, there. that people realize that there is a neg- there 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 are deaf people who exist and who need to access all of this so when you are make it, like doing any event for that matter which is a physical event whenever we start doing it again make sure it's accessible for wheelchair users and people with mobility impairment so if it's there if, if people at least see it even if they there is no wheelchair yeah. user coming they see, see it okay, stays yeah, in them yeah 
yes so that's a visual it, yeah. so it's a very valid input build over time. yeah yeah so for example whatever video that you are making make sure it is captioned if you are not because if it's global of course every country has a different sign language but if it's captioned at least in a standard english then deaf can access that right and so also you need to understand that when we are being accessible and inclusive we are not just uh, 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 impacting and benefiting the disabled community we are benefiting the larger audience as well yeah that's exactly what i by asked the question yeah yeah so the the say for example small features right so the you use pinch in and pinch out in your phone to uh, for mm. images right to see mm-hmm. it bigger yeah that was designed for low vision people but you use it every day mm. right so and uh, if you are talking about the smss so which have now um, upgraded to whatsapp text and we all text more than talking on the phone so that was designed for the deaf not for you but you all use it it's convenience so if you make a ramp that would benefit even a pregnant woman an elderly person and even a yeah. person who is carrying heavy luggage so it, it it spreads across the spectrum if you are making uh, your content in easy language for the deaf or people with learning disabilities you are enabling that content for person whose first language is not english or not your language they can still understand uh, no no i got it yeah as got others it. yeah so it spreads across and it benefits everyone that is the beauty of it okay so there is a question here uh, let me just read that out from vidya ma'am are there teachers capacitated to handle such students in a normal school considering the strength of students in every class in sections i think you already answered that uh, during the conversation yeah vidya i hope you got your answer uh, okay i think in in 5 minutes we need to wind up so how did you get to forbes i mean uh, a lot of entrepreneurs like me dream of getting there so i know you've won enough and more awards i think i need to read that out too but uh, in the meantime uh, you could generally explain how you got there uh, and all the international um, uh, fellowships that you've won from global good fund fellow to um, the zero project uh, i mean uh, how, how how do you handle all this <laughs> I don't know it just happened I have like people ask me who does your PR I'm like no one I I don't have the money to do PR <laughs> uh, like I'm a bootstrapped entrepreneur so it's just that you focus on your work and the work speaks for itself I think that is what like you know and keep on improving like uh if i even tell for myself what i was one year ago and what i am today it's a lot different even yeah, as a business just... and as a, an individual so that's an ever evolving journey of improvement for everyone and just keep on doing your work the better that you can in the best possible way you can and um, i think the tribe would co- come along i mean that's and these awards whether it's the zero project at united nations we and that was my first um, uh, international travel by the way <laughs> i had never uh, traveled outside the country you know i i am com- a person who started a travel company who's least traveled <laughs> perhaps <laughs> was but then now i should be really it. proud of where you reach i think i wouldn't be doing justice to the show if i don't uh, actually announce the the The, your achievements most influential leaders in the tourism industry awarded global mic and luxury travel conference global good fund fellow usa nasdaq entrepreneurial center mmi graduate india inclusion summit fellow united delhi fellow we are the city rising star award rex karimveer chakra award and global fellow exceptional women of excellence award at women economic forum india that i could see exceptional women Yeah so i mean hats off to you neha i've 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 watched you i have known you very closely and i've seen your struggles and your accolades at the same length in breadth it's not been an easy journey for you i know but what you're doing is incredible and the message that you're giving out is something uh, that we all need to understand imbibe and carry with us uh, now the thing that i i think i have very quickly decided to do is any of my videos that go out from now will have the uh, the super going so that everyone can understand even if 
uh, their 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 i mean uh, disabled from a disability space so i think such small baby steps if people watching us can begin somewhere in their line of space or action or work that in itself would would talk volumes about the change that we are trying to incorporate or try to trying to bring about uh, is there any other message because i would really want this video to go to as many educators and as as many stakeholders in the education as possible so if there is one thing that you would want to tell them uh, where they could begin with small steps such as such uh, i think we can end with that uh so i think we should start with one thing that um, that everyone is equitable there is no they versus us okay what people try to say ki you know that's a disability group and that an lgbtq group and that you cannot put people into buckets and you cannot differentiate between people so it's not they versus us it's always us all of us are us that's one second um uh there, there is always an intersectionality involved so you know uh the you, why we cannot put people into buckets it could be a black uh, autistic uh, gay person who might uh, be around you so you cannot really put into a separate bucket so and it could be anyone second whatever you are doing as an individual as an organization or institution or whatsoever always start with the thought who am i excluding by what am i doing right now and if you get the answer that i'm not excluding everyone like consider all the kind of neurodiverse uh, people that can exist uh it's not easy it's not difficult to you know list them out that all sorts of people that can have access to whatever you are doing make sure you don't exclude anyone and what you are building and uh, there you have the answer once you get that answer no i'm not excluding anyone you are there so you know and i like i mentioned it's a journey start with whatever resources you have at the moment do the best of that you can and keep on evolving and if you need help of course uh, uh, the tribe is there to help you out i am there and um, so many good people who are doing good work are there so and uh, if if there is anyone who uh, really needs help with ideas and understanding the space would you mind sharing your email id uh, so that they can reach out to you yeah yeah sure so i am at neha at planetabled.com that's very easy neha at planetabled.com so i think uh, the larger message that you gave out here that we shouldn't be putting people uh, in buckets and that uh, there is no they versus us actually resonates with the message of socio converse which says together we can and only together we can so uh, this has been a phenomenal conversation and something that uh, not many uh, have done before so i'm really i mean uh, grateful to you to have agreed to come uh, on board to talk and share your experiences in this space and we really hope uh, that in the next couple of months there uh, at least some people take this uh, baby steps uh, towards a larger change that you've been struggling for i've been struggling for for the last so many years and wish you all the best neha and uh, i am sure you would reach uh, where you dream of and i know your dreams so <laughs> keep going girl i mean quite thank proud you of my you. pleasure yes yeah thank you to all uh, the viewers and we would really be grateful if you could share this and uh, get the message uh, to wider audience to as many people as possible because we're talking about inclusivity inclusion accessibility and becoming one together thank you so much have a lovely evening we would be back with social conversations with another exceptional guest very soon thank you